Struggling to stay up to date with social media? Do you want to get ahead online? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Public Sector Marketing Show, the podcast for public sector professionals who want to elevate their digital communications. Here's your host, Joanne Sweeney. Hello and welcome to Season 6 and Episode 104 of the Public Sector Marketing Show. In today's episode, I'm getting serious. Serious about the disruption of mainstream media, attacks on journalists and the threats to our democracy. Online hate is increasing. Politicians are hanging up their political boots as it has become too much and decision makers fear backlash and potential personal attacks. I'll talk about the challenges to democracy and the role of media, social media, and the challenges governments, politicians, and public sector are facing right now. I really do worry about the future of our democracy, and it is something that we cannot take for granted. I really understand that people are angry, we've emerged from a pandemic, we've gone through a cost of living crisis, and people are under pressure. But... In saying that, and I welcome that social media has democratized the citizen voice, we are living through times that we have never seen before. And social media is almost becoming a a tool of warfare against what we know to be democracy. So while citizen journalism has added a new dimension to media as we know it, we need a strong, we need independent media, we need strong state media Uh, like never before. So I speak to an expert in this field in today's show. Marius Dragomir is the director of the Centre for Media, Data and Society. And honestly, I could have extended our interview by hours. His work is so fascinating. So stay tuned. In today's column, I'm asking a hard-hitting question with probably no simple answer. And that question is, is democracy at threat because of social media or because of a more untrustworthy mainstream media? It really is a big question and probably one that I cannot answer in a 40-minute podcast. However, what I can say, and I've been studying media communications, PR and social media for over 20 years now, is that its evolution is reshaping society. First of all, let's look at some evidence and research from Reuters and the University of Oxford. Uh, And they say, and they've been saying it for a number of years, that mainstream media continues to be disrupted. Now, it's not just being disrupted by social media, it's been dis- being disrupted by technology, by AI, um, by, you know, more groups on either side of the centre politically. But here's what 314 news leaders from 56 countries had to say about mainstream media now that they're working in. They say that news avoidance and news fatigue remains a major concern for them as citizens and consumers turn off the news and maybe go elsewhere to consume news and entertainment. 63% of those leaders are worried about a sharp decline in referral traffic to media websites from social media. I'm already seeing it myself with the radio stations that I work with. Chartbeat data shows traffic to news sites from Facebook fell 48% in 2023, with traffic from X, formerly known as Twitter, declining by 27%. Shifts in content formats and prioritizing different content formats is a new thing for these leaders. They say that they're going to focus more on video, up 64%, more customized and targeted newsletters, up 52%, and more podcasts, up 47%. There's also a shift on their focus in relation to what social networks they're going to give their attention to. So Facebook had a minus 38 net score, X had a minus 39 uh, score, while TikTok gained uh, credence of plus 55 Instagram plus 39, YouTube plus 44, and WhatsApp plus 61. So again, as public sector comms pros or whether you're in mainstream media, you should be looking at this research to inform your strategies. Obviously, interest in TikTok 
maybe last year and the year before was to target an audience under 25, but we now know that TikTok audiences are growing in age. So there are some of the factors that are disrupting mainstream media right now. Public sector pros, do you want to progress in your career? Are you going for promotion? Do you want to stay ahead of the digital media landscape? We can help you. View our training calendar at publicsectormarketingpros.com. In today's consulting segment, I'm talking about the important role of journalism in society. And I used to be a journalism, and as you know, they are skills and competencies that I hold very dear and that I still lean into today. You know, and journalism asks questions of governments, of our politicians, of our public sector. It asks questions of big business, pharma, NGOs. That's its job. Their job is to scrutinize, to probe, to investigate. Um, and being a former broadcast journalist, I really relished this part of my job, but also the fact that I was sharing news and information that was wholly in the public interest. But journalists or media companies are now not the sole owners of stories and news anymore. And in fact, a European Parliament Research Service study of 2016 stated that news and media is now a commodity owned by anyone willing to create it. And that includes me, my friends, and the books that I write and the podcasts and the videos and the social media content that I produce. News and media is a commodity owned by anyone willing to create it. And so the competition for attention is growing um, for mainstream media. And in this election year, 2024, more than half of the world's population will go to the polls. And this is striking, I guess, more fear and terror um, in those of us that believe in democracy and the truth and having trusted sources as the inroads made by other nefarious actors to try and divide and conquer is ever more present. So journalists play a really important role during this election year in communicating to voters the information that they need to know to make informed choices. We also should consider the democratic principle of freedom of speech. So that means that people have the right to freely express their views and opinions and to question or to criticize the government. And this is enabled by a free and independent press which is really important. But let's also think about where advertising budgets are going. And this is another disrupting factor to mainstream media. And, you know, we have to remember media is a business. They cannot operate or scale or expand their efforts or their operations without having money in the bank. And the money that they get primarily is advertising revenue. But have a listen to this data. So Irish media company Core Media did a study of total media spend across offline media and online media in 2023 and in 2024. And that's expected to reach one and a half billion euro. So, but where is the money going? So let me have a look at the figures here. So of that total advertising pot right now in Ireland, digital is taking 64.2% of that advertising budget. And within that 64% figure, the majority of it is going to Meta, which is Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and to Google, which is Google, and also to YouTube. Um, and so you can see the big tech media conglomerates are sucking the revenue out of mainstream media, which is making their battle for attention and prominence and focus much more difficult. Again, in an Irish context, uh, radio is getting 10% of that advertising revenue, print is getting 4%, TV getting 15%, out of home 6%, and then cinema just less than half a percent. So media is being disrupted. Journalism needs to hold firm, and as citizens, we must realize the importance and impact of our own voice online. For what is at stake? It's democracy, something that we cannot take for granted as war rages in the Middle East, Europe, and beyond.
I've got a fascinating interview coming up with Marius Dragomir. He's the director of the Centre for Media, Data and Society. He previously worked for the Open Society Foundations for over a decade. And since 2007, he's managed the research and policy portfolio of the programme on independent journalism, formerly the Network Media Programme in London. He's also been one of the main editors for PIJ's flagship research and advocacy project, Mapping Digital Media, which covered 56 countries worldwide. And he was the main writer and editor of television across Europe. So loads of experience at the forefront of research in the area of mainstream media. So I asked him a whole host of questions, including is social media disrupting mainstream media to its detriment? Marius, thank you so much for joining me on the Public Sector Marketing Show. Yes, thank you very much for your invitation. So listen, first of all, tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit about you and your work. Sure. Uh, so um, my name is Marius Dragomir. I am the, uh, the director of a research institution that is called the Media and Journalism Research Center. Um, essentially what we do as the name of the the um, the center is saying we do research what's important to say is that we um, look at uh, various issues of relevance for the media and journalism sector um, and the second thing that's that's important to say is that we have a global mandate so we operate in, in in a number of countries and of course we don't cover all the countries in the world but we uh, we do extend our research network uh, uh, across europe and beyond europe um, and um, uh, also an important uh, aspect of our work is is the comparative aspect. So what we do in most of our projects, we cover media and journalism related trends in a number of countries with the, the, the goal of comparing uh, trends and seeing what's happening in various national contexts. And finally, uh, it's important to say that we always work with local experts. Um, we, we have partners and partner organizations um, that are mostly universities, ac other academic institutions, but also NGOs and media uh, media outlets with uh, with which we we cooperate in in doing this research. So, like I worked as a broadcast journalist about two decades ago, and then the word media was very easy to understand. It's media outlets and journalists working for them, but what does the word media right now mean in the context of your work? Uh, sure, of course, over the past, uh, um, as you said, uh, two decades, there have been major um, uh, changes, uh, fundamental shifts in, in how the media outlets operate. And of course, we still use this term mainstream media, um, and we still have in, in many in many countries in the world, the, some of the largest, for example, broadcasters that, that uh, still draw a lot of attention and, and large uh, audiences. Uh, in many countries in the world, still television is the main source of news and information. But on the other hand, if you if you really look at the, the media ecosystem, of course, a lot of things have changed, and um, uh, we have definitely the um, uh, a new sector, a lot of newly set up media outlets that have been uh, that have been established over the past uh, two decades. Uh, some of these media outlets are simply uh, news portals that were established sometimes, you know, by just one journalist who left their left his or her work to, to start a, a new outlet that a new outlet that then developed and, and grew um, on the other hand we have of course investments investors that have been um, funding uh, large media outlets online and uh, to, to a certain extent they, they had quite a lot of commercial success others have not as we have seen recently a number of the, a number of large media, uh, digital media outlets uh, started to, to close. Uh, but what's important to say in this um, uh, changing uh, media world, I think on the one hand is, uh, is important to know the fact that the funding model for the media has changed dramatically. Um, of course, many media outlets are still relying on advertising, but the old traditional model has changed because we have in the media ecology the large tech companies that uh, that um, uh, are now taking a large part of the advertising spend uh, the second thing that uh, i would I, I would note is that the fact that we have of course because of all these media outlets and this fragmentation of the market 
uh, increasing competition. Uh, that's that's an obvious trend that that we see all, almost everywhere, especially when it comes to to commercial gains, to uh, to advertising, as I said. Um, and um, it's um, uh, it's also uh, very important to uh, to know that there there was a massive shift in in the operation of the media uh, in the old in the old days, meaning before the internet, you had a certain uh, division of work, depending on whether you work for a broadcast uh, company, for a television station, for a radio station. Um, then you had a very clear division of work when you were when when you uh, were a journalist for a print media outlet. Uh, now things have changed dramatically because you have um, you you need new skills. Um, every media outlet has to invest a lot and have people who take care of the distribution aspect. The distribution was always very important in the old days, but it was a different uh, type of um, of thinking there. Um, so I think these are the, the main changes and they are fundamental in, in how, how media outlets are funding themselves, how they are competing and how they are staffing the, you know, their operations. Uh, if you look at these three aspects, I think you see how the media has evolved over the, over the past two decades. So how would you diagnose or describe the state of mainstream media right now? Is it as strong pre-internet or even in the last five years? Or is its impact uh, and stature being eroded by, by digital and social media? Um, I think definitely you have... Um, you have media outlets that that have managed to 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 defend their market position, um, and as I just mentioned, I think you still have in many countries the large broadcasters that are that are drawing large audiences. But definitely, when you look at the whole picture, and if you if you analyze the impact of this fresh competition in media markets, you you see that definitely their their uh, position has been eroded by other media outlets. Now, where that is going is a different question because it's not. We, are, we cannot talk uh, just about media market these days. We have a number of other factors. We have different channels of, of communication and information. So there are a lot, the, 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 the communication and media ecology is definitely more nuanced and more complex than I think it has ever been. So as you know, uh, this is a big election year right across the world. Uh, we're both in Europe. Um, we've got European elections happening over a number of days in June, the US, but there are over 50 countries going to the polls this year. Talk to me about who's going to dominate or what's going, what channels are going to dominate this, these election conversations and coverage. Um, yes, uh, that's uh, obviously I think one of the uh, the most uh, important uh, topics this this year. We have a number, um, a lot of elections in many in many countries, and at the same time, I think uh, it's important to mention the fact that there are elections in in uh, large democracies at the same time, countries with a very uh, big uh, geopolitical impact. So definitely, it's something that that we are all looking into uh, when it comes to our work. We we are analyzing a bit this year the um, uh, the link between the finances that are being spent on political advertising and campaigning in in the countries that have elections, um, and we also uh, analyze uh, the, to a certain degree the uh, the performance of the media outlets in these countries. So, based on that, to answer your question, I think we have an uh, we have various scenarios here when when it comes to countries with for example what we notice with strong public service media that have uh, independent public media and it, this this type of media is is unfortunately um, still in place only in a few countries and most of them are in western europe so if you look at elections in belgium finland but also if we look at a country like taiwan uh, which has a very strong public service um, uh, system uh, they usually have a, a more informed citizenry and the performance of the media and the, the, the access to information is healthier than in other countries. But then when you look at many other countries that have elections this year, well, the, the media that dominate are what we call captured media, media outlets that are controlled by the government or by businesses that are very close to, uh, to the government and to the political parties that are usually in, in, in power. And that is not a healthy sign because of course what what you see is a lot of, of propaganda and when you have this situation of media capture the problem there is that you have this um, appearance of diversity in the media but in fact 
uh, a lot of these channels, most of these channels are controlled by uh, an elite, a, a very small group of interests that, that have interest both in politics and, and in business. Um, so I think that this is what we see in the media. On the other hand, of course, we shouldn't ignore the um, impact of social media. We have seen uh, during the past 10 and more years that um, in every major election, social media played a major role. Um, and of course, they will play, I, I believe, and we see that they continue to play that role. But when uh, when we compare these uh, the elections this year to those, for example, four years ago um, in the United States and other other democracies, uh, I, I, we tend to see a, like a less influence by social media because of many reasons. People are moving to other platforms. On the other hand, we have seen that some of the social media have changed dramatically the way they present information. If you look just at Meta, uh, Facebook, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, the, the amount of news has been diminished significantly because of, an, of a number of developments. Um, and that is probably that probably means less influence when it comes to the news media present on the platform. But still, they have a lot of influence when it comes to how uh, people present on the platform influence each other. And of course, here we have a, a lot of uh, accounts that have been established by by various governments that continue to have influence. Um, so I think it's a mix of, of these three trends. Um, I, of course, the, it's important to, to mention that uh, the, in, in, this, in any of these uh, type of um, context, the, uh, it's really important to have independent journalism. And the problem that you don't have that is a major issue and probably the most serious issue that, that we see in many democracies today. Would you say that citizens in 2024 are more or less informed uh, pre-social media days? Uh, that's a that's a huge question, and probably it's uh, it's worth a, a book. Uh, I mm -hmm. think uh, if if we look at the, the the developments in the communication space over the the, the past uh, years, and or even more, uh, of course. Uh, the, 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 you can see that people, uh, it's very hard to, to say whether people are more informed or less informed simply because you need a lot more research and it's very actually hard to really understand how people consume information and, and all that. But what's in, what we can say is the fact that um, definitely I think in many countries in the world, even in, in countries with a lot of uh, dominated by autocracies, you have people have more access to news and information today than they ever had. That doesn't mean, though, that uh, they are better informed or uh, simply because when, when you analyze a lot of these media uh, systems in the world, you see that in parallel with this increase in the access to news and, and information, you have uh, a growth or the uh, strengthening of the, uh, the systems of capture and control by, by governments, by, by businesses and all that. So on the one hand, you have a lot of propaganda i think we at this moment in time we have um, the a level of propaganda that has reached the peak with that uh, i think we we haven't um, had before even if you compare it with the old days of the cold war on the other hand you have people seemingly having access to an increased number of sources of information so i think the answer is somewhere there um, and yes, in some countries, obviously, people have are more better and more informed than in the others. But on on the other hand, I think we have to actually go be, beyond the appearances because the the situation is more complex. So I think it's it's a very complex situation. But I tend to believe that uh, people are not are better off just in uh, in a very few countries. And so artificial intelligence has now become mainstream, and I know your center is also researching the impact of of AI on media, but what are the major digital threats that you think are here and are threatening media and potentially the independence of it, but also um, the trustworthiness of, of media? Yeah, um, well, I, I think the AI, uh, the AI factor is, is there and I, I think we only started now to, to analyze it. There are a lot of colleagues from other institutions and universities that have, who have been doing a lot of research in, in, in recent years on this topic, and I think we need to, to know more. Um, I, I tend to believe looking just at the, the, the number of uh, the type of companies offering these services that AI will pose a lot of dangers, obviously, because of the, um, uh, you know, the, the 
capacity of producing all types of content in all kinds of uh, contexts. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's um, we shouldn't exaggerate. I think that uh, that uh, impacts so much, and I, I I think we need a lot more information and, and research to really understand how newsrooms are using uh, this information. How, on the other hand, governments are are using artificial intelligence. On the other hand, I think it's very clear that um, uh, what we are now witnessing is is another wave of uh, major shifts in the media uh, ecosystem and this uh, these uh, changes have to do with a lot of changes that are happening at the, at the level of tech companies. We've seen, as I, as I just mentioned, that Facebook has changed a lot the way it approaches news and, and, and content. We have seen the changes in, um, in other platforms, the ownership changes in Twitter. Uh, it's been already a few years. That, uh, that ownership change had a lot of impact on how Twitter now X, uh, uh, the, the platform is, is operating. So I think the, the social media ecology is changing massively. And that that is posing a lot of a lot of threats in in the way you know people are are um, consuming news information and other types of, of information. On the other hand, a trend that seems to me uh, very dangerous is not uh, it's, it's very hard to call it digital threat because uh, it's not a digital threat, but it's coming. It's a result of all these uh, trends that have been triggered by 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 digitization. Is the, what we call news avoidance. Uh, people in in an increasing number of countries, people are starting to actually move away of news. Some of them because I think they are overwhelmed by the amount of news. But on the other hand, we see that uh, the, the there is a very um, there is a very um, uh, bad situation, economic situation in many countries, and people are really looking for the information they need, and less th that is very you know useful and you you know that this this utilitarian as we call it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, type of consumption where people are really going they don't care anymore whether this is a news platform or a newspaper or a media outlet but they just seek the information they need now they don't care where they get it um, and that is something that i think will have a lot of repercussions on on how media operate and uh, is definitely a threat uh, in itself and uh, we we see it in, in many countries even in very developed media markets um, and then the final thing that we noticed, and this is something that uh, came up through a number of analysis, but also through our discussions with people working in tech companies, is the fact that, uh, that we see a, a reverse in how people uh, communicate and react to social media. Uh, like for example, ten years ago, everybody was was uh, signing up for an account on social media, and they wanted to communicate. And now we we see uh, we have signals that people are moving into private uh, networks. A lot of a lot of conversations are taking place, and this is something that I think is already quantified by various journalists. Many people are moving away from the the social share space into a still share space, but into platforms like WhatsApp, where they create groups of interest and a lot of the conversations are taking place there in parallel with i think with the more sophistication of this uh, of this type of uh, uh, of platform so um something that's a new trend i'm not saying necessarily that it's bad it's another form of of uh, that, that people prefer of to to communicate but it's something new uh, that we haven't seen at, at this level and growing uh, before and that is going to probably affect in many ways how how people change, exchange information and 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 communicate uh, about the issues they care about yeah just to kind of build on the point around news avoidance um and people accessing news and information not necessarily from journalists or traditional media but but what about the rise of the citizen voice and the influencer so ordinary people who have a, a huge interest or passion in a particular topic or who have nefarious objectives to sway ideological views or for economic reasons, that's on the rise, right? Are you seeing that in your research? Yes, definitely. I think the, uh, the you have the answer in, in your question. Mm. You put it very well. I think there is definitely, we, we see this trend. And 
on, on the one hand, it's it's a uh, it, it's a positive trend. I'm, I'm I was born in a country that du during communism uh, in Eastern Europe uh, at a time when we had no access to uh, we had access to only one source of, of official information. Um, so coming from that background, uh, you, and there are many people actually living even today in such um, uh, in such uh, uh, you know political environments. Uh, so when when you think about it, I think the fact that you have people able to express uh, themselves and if, uh, when you have a situation where where the citizens voice voices can be heard this is definitely a positive trend and i think we have to encourage that even if, even if uh, at some point you know various forms of citizen journalism uh, affect you know the the stability the, the stability and sustainability of the media but on the other hand we have the uh, the opposite trend which you ju we just mentioned what what is happening when such some of these voices that are becoming influential and when you have an influencer that is actually being um, you know instrumentalized we use a lot this word in in, in our in our studies where people who are actually uh, starting to represent various interests and in a, in a non-transparent uh, manner i think that's a situation that that we want to avoid and that is a uh, the negative uh, you know part of the coin uh, unfortunately what what we uh, see increasingly here is that i think these more negative trends are are uh, dominating uh, in in the overall in the overall you know media uh, media ecology it's fascinating final question for you marius um elon musk uh, did his very first Irish interview about a month ago uh, with a new media outlet in Ireland called Gripped.ie. Uh, so they would be quite anti-establishment and mainstream media. But the the, the conversation was all around, around Ireland's new proposed hate legislation. And Elon was talking about free speech and how Ireland's proposed hate speech legislation might, you know, take away free speech and his platform is all about free speech. Where does free speech lie in all of this media evolution landscape? Oh, that's uh, that's another uh, uh, huge question and a very, very important. I think I think I'm very glad that you addressed that issue because I think the, why the, the the market, the media market related discussions are very important. Uh, it's, it's very important to also think about and, and research and, and uh, take into account account Cons consumption patterns and what people, where people are moving and, and consuming media, news and content generally. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's really important to go back to this to this issue, you know, the issue of media freedom, freedom of expression, uh, and how people, uh, how the right to freedom of expression is actually protected in, in the digital environment in which we, we live in. Um, so I, uh, how to, uh, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that this uh, the freedom of expression should still you know sit at the the base at the still be the fundament of any kind of uh, media related policies that that are adopted in europe i think this is really important to acknowledge and not to give up the fight for the freedom of expression on the other hand i think it's very important to to really acknowledge the fact that at the level of media policy we have seen a, a number of uh, problematic uh, developments on the one hand you have countries uh, the the type of autocracies where governments are adopting media uh, media policies and, and legislation that is really um, uh, having a, a chilling effect on on independent journalists and we can hear like even mention a lot of european union uh, countries we have seen for some some time the example of hungary uh, which uh, the, the government there in, in power for more than 14 years uh, has been um, has has been um, uh, you know, uh, adopting a number of very problematic policies that had a very negative, a negative impact on on independent journalism. On the other hand, I think what what is really worrying is um, you know the the this effect of the disinformation debate that it has on policies. Um, and of course, while that is a very while disinformation is a, is a very worrying trend. On the other hand, we already have seen a number of countries. Um, I think uh, Pointer Institute and um, uh, another organization in the United States called CIMA, um, Center for International Media Assistance, they published a number of several reports in, in actually uh, recently that have looked at uh, how many governments in the world have used the uh, pretext of this information to adopt legislation that is in fact 
very problematic um, and detrimental for freedom of expression and media media freedom uh, in other words they use the uh, disinformation and the fake news uh, argument to actually go after independent journalists so essentially what is happening governments are defining what fake news is they adopt legislation you know punishing journalists sometimes even with prison terms um, and then based on uh, you know however they define this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this information they they can actually go after journalists so that's that's a very uh, that's a very serious trend that that we have seen again uh, documented in many in dozens of countries and i think that will continue and we have to to really fight back and uh, uh, against uh, these uh, really worrying trends Marius, obviously the, the work that you and your colleagues are doing is so important um, to, to inform policy, but also to identify those tra trends in uh, an old world where everything is being disrupted, absolutely everything. But listen, I could talk to you for hours about this, but I want to thank you sincerely for your time, for your, for your expertise and your insights and uh, just continued success on the great work and important work that you and your colleagues are doing at the center. Thank you very much. And thank you again for, for your invitation. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Mario. So before I wrap up this episode, just a quick reminder that our three accredited professional diplomas are now available on demand on our website, publicsectormarketingpros.com. You can take them when you want, but you also get that one-to-one -one coaching and mentoring from me. If you haven't already shared the Public Sector Marketing Show with a pro that you know, imagine the impact it would have that if every listener shared it with one colleague. That would be huge for me. Um, so I really do appreciate the support. Um, and just a final plug for my book, the second edition of Public Sector Marketing Pro. It's now available on Audible, but of course it's also available in hard copy on Amazon or wherever you like to buy your books online. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will see you on the next episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a public sector pro you know. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. For more free resources, details of our upcoming training courses, and consulting options, log on to publicsectormarketingpros.com.